um, go ahead and get started. And I'm just going to um, turn it over to our president and CEO, Barry Ostrowski, to give us some welcome remarks. Thank you, Deanna. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted that as many of you uh, has, have joined this uh, equitable encounter, as you know, we do this monthly. It's part of our journey to ensure that we become an anti-racist organization and have the platform on which to advocate that society in general be anti-racist. Uh, today's special guest is an incredibly accomplished and insightful visionary when it comes to the topic of microaggressions. I have to tell you, subject to uh, Jennifer correcting me later, I view microaggressions perhaps as the most pernicious and toxic of all of a racist behavior. It's so heavily ingrained in people's everyday behavior. Uh, some don't notice it, who perpetrate it. Uh, and sadly, most people don't realize the uh, hurt uh, that it is, it afflicts uh, on those who are the subject to these microaggressions. We have to purge our behavior of these microaggressions. We can't do it overnight. Uh, but we have to recognize them and we have to insist that they stop. Uh, and uh, Deanna and her team and organizing us on this journey, I know will come up with ways for us to be able to do that, to talk about it, and to all adopt better behavioral patterns. And on that subject, uh, and I kind of feel as though I'm preaching to the converted, Deanna and I put out a memo yesterday reflecting the fact that many people have been asked to participate in a number of educational sessions and frankly we don't think the response has been sufficiently uh, embracing uh, and so that memo i encourage all of you to read it it simply says when invited participate uh, because we need your input now frankly if you're on this equitable encounter undoubtedly you don't fall into that category but every one of us has to be an advocate to our colleagues to participate. So on top of everything else, unfortunately, I'm asking you uh, who are participating today uh, to help us gather up all of our colleagues and have them participate in our anti-racist uh, journey. So once again, I thank you all for your participation. I know we'll learn an awful lot today. Some of it won't be easy to, to accept, uh, but I have to tell you, I'm convinced, as I said, that it's a, it's not only real, uh, but it is hurtful beyond that which can be easily described. Uh, so with that, I'll sit back and be educated and hope we all will as well. Thank you, Deanna. Barry, thank you so much and thank you for your continued um, support throughout this journey. Uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Jones, I just want to remind us all of the ground rules. Um, that everyone's voice is valued and, um, and also that this event is being taped. So if in fact you um, make a comment and you don't want it shared, please reach out to us, either um, Stacy or I via our email addresses, which you can find in the directory or at endingracism at rwjbh.org. And with that, I turn it over to you, Dr. Jones. Thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate thank you. it. Thank you so much, Deanna. And thank you so much, uh, Mr. Oskowitz. See, um, I am so privileged to be here today and I am grateful that you have an organization that really values diversity and values understanding microaggressions and how race plays out, not only in our everyday lives, but also at work. And so a little bit about myself, I'm a licensed psychologist in New York and in New Jersey, and I'm currently the Associate Director of the Counseling Center here um, at Rutgers. And before I did all of that, I spent 10 years working uh, in corrections and forensic psychology, and that's where I really started looking at race and microaggressions and racial trauma. And Throughout the um, last 10 years, so much has happened, and we'll talk about a lot of the things that have been impactful, but just know that these terms that I'll be talking about today aren't new. They haven't come about in the last month or the last year since um, a lot of the killings that have happened. 
they've really been here as long as our society has been um, going on. And it's really just in the last few years that these terms and these ideas have come to the forefront where we're really starting to address it. Before I um, start, I always talk about self-care and the importance of taking care of yourself. And so I wanted to give you a trigger warning. We'll be talking about a lot of difficult things. I won't be showing any videos, none of my slides are graphic, but they can be racially charging. And I wanna make sure that when you're done with the presentation, you take a, a pause, take some time for yourself to regroup before you go back to work. And I always end with hope and to be encouraged because when we talk about race and we talk about really heavy things, sometimes it really feels like are things going to get better? Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? And I'm a believer that because you've logged in, because you're learning, because we are now really trying to be better, that things can change, whether they be within your family, within the individual, community, and society-wide. The reason why this topic is so important because we're all exposed to issues of race and racism, microaggression, racial trauma in our daily walk, on at our jobs, in society. And it's so important that we talk about it in an open and factual and compassionate way. Because even if we don't, it is the elephant in the room. It's race is always there, whether we talk about it or don't talk about it. But the more we talk about it, the more we demystify it, and the more we can understand other people's perspectives. And race and racism can be seen in every corners, in every walk of life, in every profession, including healthcare, including in systems um, that were created oftentimes to um, hold back and hold down marginalized populations. And that's why it's so important that you have these equitable encounters to really open our eyes to things that we might be doing on a daily basis that are not only hurting ourselves, but can be hurting our colleagues and hurting the people around us. Can you, can you hear me okay? Okay. So in order to start, I really want to talk about racial trauma before we get into microaggressions. And the reason for that is the impact of microaggressions is not just that one individual event, it is couched in a society where we're facing stereotypes, discrimination, prejudice, and all of these fall under racial trauma. There's a quote by Dr. Kenneth Hardy, and he's a psychologist as well, and he says, racial trauma is a form of interpersonal violence that can lacerate the spirit, scar the soul, and puncture the psyche. I put this quote in a lot of my presentations as a reminder that racial trauma is not something you just get over. Having somebody say something hurtful to you isn't something you just get over. And you're not overreacting when something is impactful and harms you in a way that makes you wanna speak up against it. And so as I talk today, I really want you to picture someone you're close to who might look very different than you, sound different than you, be from a different um, gender identity, different race. Because if as I'm talking to you, it doesn't resonate, imagine what it is like for that person who you're close to and it might resonate for them. So as a foundation, racial trauma, it is the stressful impact or emotional pain that you experience when you're dealing with race, racism, discrimination, or racial violence. Just like trauma, when we talk about physical, emotional, sexual abuse that has lasting impacts, racial trauma also has lasting impacts. So you can directly experience it. Um, someone can call you out of your name, a racial slur. You can be um, stereotyped or discriminated against. You also can witness racial trauma. And so that could be watching it on the news, hearing about it in your social media feed, hearing stories of your loved ones telling you about the trauma they've endured. And where a lot of us fall in, particularly in the last few years, is repeated exposure to details of traumatic events. And so what that is, um, is vicarious trauma. That means it's not happening directly to you. It's not happening directly to someone you love or know personally, but you are still affected by it 
from watching it on television, from seeing it in your newsfeed, from seeing it in your social media. And you can have effects as if you had gone through the trauma yourself. And I know for me, when, um, when George Floyd was killed, when he was murdered, I could not watch that video at first because I knew what it would do to my spirit. I have friends who feel like they have to watch everything so that they can be reminded of the terrible things that are happening to the people in the, in the society. And so for those of you who've watched things inadvertently, you know, you're scrolling through Facebook and all of a sudden you see a live feed. For those of you, you for those of you who remember um, Philando Castile, his murder was broadcast live on Facebook at, during a traffic stop. Sometimes we can't help but see these images, hear about these, these things. And it's not something that you can just get over. It is trauma. And so when we talk about trauma and racial trauma, there's some foundational terms that we all need to be on the same page with. One is stereotyping. So these are beliefs that um, individuals have about a particular social group and Excuse me, let's see, there we go. And so some stereotypes that are negative that we often hear, so for white males, they're all privileged, they're all racist. For white females, they're all Karens, they're all nosy. When we talk, think about black male stereotypes, they're violent, they're aggressive, they're lazy. Black female negative stereotypes, the welfare mother, the angry black woman. Um, negative stereotypes for our Asian population, Asian males, they're all technically competent, they're the model minority, Asian women, all meek, quiet, passive, Latinx males, they're all illegal, they're hard labor workers, uh, Latinx females, fiery, hypersexualized. And so while consciously we think all of these things are horrible, we would not quickly identify somebody as any of these stereotypes, we're gonna talk about bias and unconscious bias and how that plays into a lot of the microaggressions that happen, not just at work, but in society. Some other foundational terms are is prejudice. And this is judging someone before you even know who they are, what they're about. And it's the attitude that you have about a particular social group. Again, before really having any knowledge, just as the word said, you're prejudging before um, you get to know the person. Then you have discrimination, and this is the result of prejudice. And so you're treating somebody or a group of people differently based on this prejudice, based on these stereotypes. And a lot of discrimination can be overt or it could be covert. And when we talk about bias, I think it's so important that everybody you know, on this call realize that we all can be biased. We all have biases. And it's not just white coworkers, it's not just coworkers in power, it is all of us. And so it's so important that we check these biases, but it's important to know that those in power, when you have a bias, when you have um, implicit bias, which we'll talk about in a second, that can cause harm to those who don't have power and who are more marginalized. So bias runs contrary to your beliefs. You can think, you know, I, I see an individual, I'm going to judge them on their character. I'm going to get to know the person. I am going to make sure that I um, do everything equitable. Bias runs contrary to all that. It is unconscious and it's that quick automated associations we have. And so it can be innate or learned. And many people develop biases for or against individuals, a lot of times out of their awareness. And that's where we get into implicit bias. And so again, it runs contrary to our beliefs and can often cause harm because we operate so quickly without checking ourselves when it comes to different situations, whether it be with our coworkers, whether it be with family and friends, and their rapid automatic associations. And so as Deanna mentioned, I'm a psychologist, and so we like to do experiments. So I'm gonna experiment on everybody on this call. What I'm gonna do is show you a word. And when you see that word, think about the first image, the first thought, the first picture that comes to mind when you hear uh, when you hear and see this word. So I'm gonna go ahead. Government. Corporate. 
subsidized housing, suburbs. Now, as I said each word and showed each word, a thought popped into your head, an image popped into your head, and it was so quick, so automated. You're like, you might have thought to yourself, how did that get in there when you heard some of these words? And you might be shocked, but now that it's in your awareness, you know, when you hear the word government, the first thought that pops into your head is what? And so imagine if Deanna introduced me and said, this is Dr. Jones. She used to work for the government, but now she works for a big corporation and she has come to talk to us about microaggressions. Did you know that she grew up in subsidized housing, but now she lives in the suburbs, Dr. Jones? So hearing all those words puts me in, um, you already have an idea of me based on the words from my introduction. And so those quick automatic associations have to be checked because if she introduced me that way, in that way, and obviously you don't know me, you might read my bio, but as I'm speaking, you have these images of who I am and what I am based on that. Additionally, as you see me, I'm a black woman, I'm cisgendered, um, and as you listen to me, you're also listening to me in that lens of, you know, who's speaking to me today? Black educated woman who has, happens to be a psychologist. I am. I hail from the great state of New Jersey, like probably most of you. And all of those things come with weight and all of those things come with implicit bias. So unconscious bias and implicit bias in healthcare is can be and is very harmful. And so healthcare providers, and for those of you who are on the call who might not be patient providers directly, but still work in the system, we all have unconscious bias. And so many non-medical factors can influence medical decisions and the way in which we interact with our patients. And so the patient's style of dress, race, ethnicity, gender, um, their insurance status, or even the setting in which you're working. Are you working in Newark versus New Brunswick? Camden versus um, Middlesex, Princeton versus Bergen County. And so just in where the, the patient is embedded can cloud or make you think automatic associations of who that person is before you know them. Some more unconscious bias, uh, it can lead to false assumptions and negative outcomes, as well as negative outcomes, particularly for marginalized populations. And so it's not that we don't have automatic associations for white people, but often those associations aren't necessarily negative or can cause harm. And so we have to be really careful that we're checking these unconscious biases. Um, some other, un, un, excuse me, some other unconscious bias that we have, and sometimes it's overt, sometimes it's covert, but white male doctors are less likely to prescribe pain medication to black patients than white patients. And so that falls into direct um, medical care. And again, we might be quickly thinking, I don't do that. I treat everybody. I listen to everybody. I I'm very conscious of the way in which I'm in act, interacting with my patients. Be very careful to think that you never do something because then you never check the biases that you have. And again, we all have them. And so it might help look over your records, have somebody else look over your records, look over um, some of the things you've done in the past years and see, are there patterns? Are there ways in which I may be, not consciously, but unconsciously looking at patients differently? Um, addi additionally, um, doctors assume that black or low income patients are less intelligent or more likely to engage in risky behaviors and less likely to adhere to medical advice. And so again, when we talk about um, power and privilege, and when we talk about, um, you know, even the doctor patient relationship, or if you're a social worker or a psychologist um, working in this field, there's a power dynamic. And so if you think someone's, you know, they're not going to follow through with this treatment plan. So you know what, I'll just make this the easiest plan possible, but it might not be the best plan. And so we change and do our decisions based on our biases. So it's so important that we check them. Um, women presenting with cardiac heart disease symptoms are significantly less likely than men to receive a diagnosis or referral to treatment due to misdiagnosis that 
they actually are stressed and they have, they're anxious versus there might be an underlining issue. Uh, pregnant women face discrimination from healthcare providers based on their ethnicity, socioeconomic background. And so um, this, again, not only affects the pregnant woman, but also affects unborn um, children. And so if you think about it, when we talk about microaggressions, racial trauma, bias, it can go from generation to generation. So we have these things called blind spots. And I want to acknowledge that this term is very ableistic and that I'm not trying to say that people who are blind are um, unconscious to the different biases, but there's just certain things that are out of our awareness. And these are unexamined prejudice. And this can be a bigger issue than outright racism. When your CEO was speaking, he was saying, you know, the, that microaggressions are insidious and whether you're conscious of them or unconscious of them, I always say, I'd rather somebody look me in the face and say, I don't like you because you're black versus me trying to guess and figure out why I'm not getting hired, why I'm not getting promoted, why am I being looked at in the store? Because it's not overt, it's covert and it's unconscious. And it's so important that we bring these things to our awareness because only by looking inward can we examine and can we repair our biases and achieve progress. So to microaggressions, all the things I just talked about really are the foundation um, in which microaggressions are embedded. And when we talk about microaggressions, um, some people call it the death by a thousand cuts because microaggressions, um, and some are larger than others, we can call them micro assaults, and I'll do the definition in a second, but they're little, they're insidious, and um, oftentimes they're brief, verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities. And it can be intentional or unintentional, but either one causes an impact and causes pain. Um, it communicates hostile or derogatory or negative slights or insults towards marginalized people. Then there's something called micro assaults, and that is overt and conscious. And that's when somebody is being explicit or being subtle about their comments, their slights, their insults, and they're expressed to marginalized groups. They can be verbal, like name calling, calling somebody um, a racial slur or using epithets, nonverbal, so not getting on an elevator with somebody um, because you know of, of their background that you're seeing, that you're judging them before you even get to know them, or clutching a handbag you know, in the presence of certain individuals, locking doors. You know, those are very overt conscious micro assaults. And when we talk about microaggressions, some examples in the workplace, you know, um, someone saying, you know, where are you really from? When you talk about um, an Asian um, American, you know, or a, his a white Hispanic, and you're saying, no, you're white, you're, you're not Hispanic. Asking someone who's gender binary, you know, are you a man or are you a woman? If you're asking somebody who identifies as gay and just say, oh, you're so jack on will and grace. And for a black identified woman, you know, what does your hair look like today? I've gotten many of those. Or somebody actually wanting to touch your hair, or put their hands in your hair. Um, when I did this talk once before, somebody said, you know, these aren't even micro, some of these comments. Some of them are, you know, they're macro aggressions because the impact is so um, hurtful. And so what I want to convey, it's not about the intent, but the impact. Um, when I talk to individuals who have never heard the term microaggressions or have, and they say, well, I was just curious. I just wanted to know some information. Or I, I made a comment. I didn't realize it was going to land that way. Or they're, they're so sensitive when I talk about issues of race or make a joke. So the intent might not be to cause harm, but the impact is that it did cause harm. And so we'll talk about what to do when you have microaggressed or did a micro assault because it's about how it lands with the person. And if someone says what you just said hurt or what you just said was inappropriate or what you just said was not called for in this moment, it's really important as someone who does microaggressions and we all can do them, that the first knee jerk 
um, thought is, I didn't mean to say, I, know, I didn't mean to do that. That's not what I meant. You're totally misunderstanding me. It's not about me. It's not about the person who did the microaggression. It's about how it landed and how to make that repair. So race, some racial microaggressions are, you know, when I look at you, I don't see color. America's a melting pot. We're all the same. There's only one race, the human race. And so these are all microaggressions because you're denying a person of color or denying a marginalized person their identity. And when we talk about, um, like, for example, I just always use myself as an example. I am an African-American woman. And when you see me, you see my color. And I'm very proud of being an African-American woman. And so when you tell somebody like me, you know, I don't see color, you know, I just see you for, you know, being smart, educated, and you're a great presenter, but I'm like, you're missing the bigger picture. You're missing my journey, how I got here, and a lot of what I've been through in my life and why I'm even doing this presentation has to do with me being an African-American woman. Um, some other racial microaggressions, you know, I'm not racist. You know, I have several black friends or as a woman, I know what you go through as a racial minority. Even I believe the most qualified person should get the job and everyone can succeed in life if they just work hard enough. And so the first one, uh, you can be racist and have black friends. Having black friends or having friends of marginalized populations, you know, a Latinx friend, an Asian friend, does not negate how, uh, does not encapsulate knowing everything about a particular um, population. And it also doesn't mean you can't transgress against um, these different marginalized populations. Um, I hear often, you know, as a woman, I know I understand what you go through as, as a black woman or, you know, I'm LGBTQ. And so I understand what you're going through with all this racial oppression. So oppression is bad no matter who is being oppressed, but they're all apples and oranges. There are different histories to that oppression. There's different uh, ways in which they're being addressed. And so for myself, you know, I'm, I'm a cisgendered um, woman who's heterosexual. I can try to empathize and understand someone who's coming from a, um, a different walk of life, but I won't compare my oppression to that person's oppression. So it's really important that we understand uh, each group in the history that comes up with that. Um, I believe the most qualified person should get the job. And when I say that, a lot of people think, well, of course, the most qualified person should get the job. But who's defining qualified? Who's defining what qualified is for that position? Is it going to an Ivy League university, having the best in internships, the best um, resume um, by CEOs of different companies? Or is it somebody who um, has a degree in that particular area? Doesn't matter which university they've come from. They have their four-year degree. Doesn't mean um, that 10 years of experience doing the same thing is equivalent to having that degree. Really understanding how you're defining qualified so you're not leaving individuals out. Someone saying everyone can succeed in society. They just worked hard enough really negates that we all don't start at the same starting line. It's a microaggression because you individuals are failing to recognize that different populations have different starting points. And if everyone worked hard enough to, to get to different places and someone really worked hard, but they're still in the same circumstance, you're making it their fault that they are not in a better circumstance versus recognizing the systemic nature and the insidious nature uh, in which our society is built to really um, honestly hold down marginalized populations. Some other racial microaggressions, you know, you're a credit to your race. You're so articulate. You're lucky there's affirmative action. Um, and so these types of things, um, you know, I, I feel like um, I, I'm a graduate of, of um, a really great program at Rutgers Gazap, and I was one of two Black individuals in my program. 
And one of the things I always think about, even in my master's program, I was one of just a few, whenever we talked about race or whenever we talked about um, difficult subjects that had to do with ethnicity or national origin, it's all eyes on the two black people to really speak for the population. And those are microaggressions. Even just everybody looking towards towards me when we're talking about, I know I, I'm also a school psychologist, um, talking about the school to prison pipeline. Well, Jennifer, what do you know about that? Um, and so when we talk about microaggressions, we have to be really important that we check why we're saying what we're saying and think before we say them. Someone's saying, where are you really from? Where were you born? You know, you speak English so well. Um, is that your real hair? Can I touch it? So I remember seeing uh, Dr. Sue, for those of you who know, he does a lot of work in this area. And he was born in this country, raised in this country. And he said after he gave a presentation just like this, someone came up to him and said, oh, you speak English so well. You know, where were you born? And he, and he said, you know, I said in my uh, presentation, I was born here. And those are microaggressions. And they are little, but they're not little because of the impact they have on individuals. And so some of the impact that has on the individual is low job satisfaction, if it's happening at work, the imposter syndrome thinking, you know, do I really belong here? Even though you are more than qualified for the position, you got hired because of the do. Sometimes you feel like, you know, am I supposed to be here? Um, Unaddressed microaggressions can lead to physical and mental health issues, traumatic stress syndrome, depression, and even suicidal ideation. You know, I run Black affinity groups um, here at Rutgers, and a lot of students come, and, you know, they're not actively suicidal or anything, but you can see how being in society where they're constantly being told you have to be twice as good in order to get half as much as you know um your white students or you're being told you know you, you're here because of affirmative action or different comments like that you know can bring on depression can bring on anxiety so it's really important that we do our own work to make sure we are not part of the problem systemically unaddressed microaggressions can affect your work and so i know we have many different departments that are logged in today but it can um, impair uh the diversity you get when you're hiring and retention are you keeping individuals diverse individuals that you're hiring how is the environment in which they are working is it safe is it um supportive um, workplace engagement might even dip. Um, so some employees lose faith and trust in their employer um, and they don't feel like your employer truly understands their um, their play and what's been going on. And that's why equitable encounters are so important because it's a way for your whole organization to be on the same page that, you know what, this is something we're gonna address and this is something we're gonna take seriously. Some other unaddressed microaggressions, employees may develop an unwillingness to speak up in meetings, may develop, um, feel like they don't wanna take on additional tasks. They even might lose motivation or a sense of purpose and even doubt their abilities. And so if you happen to be a department where there's all, it's not as diverse and the pressure is always on the individuals who may not look like everybody else in the room to perform, to call on them, to speak for that population. Um, it, it is very tiring. It is very hurtful and harmful because it's not asked of any other um, individuals um, who aren't from marginalized populations. So after talking about all the things that can happen at work, Let's talk about how we're going to change the environment. Let's talk about how we're going to address microaggressions in the workplace. There's something called micro affirmations. And these are also very small acts that are hard to see, but they can be public or private. But you're affirming a person, affirming them and their identity in that space. Um, it can be unconscious, but very effective and occur when people wish to help others succeed. And so some examples of uh, a micro affirmation is, um, again, uh, I'll, I'll speak about records because that, that's where I'm at now. 
every um, right before the holiday break, we we really celebrate everybody's culture by bringing in different foods, people bringing in things of their culture, and then allowing people to explain why they eat certain things, what they do during um, the month of December, because it can be different religions, traditions, uh, cultural events. And so these are micro affirmations that the the school was helping the students um, do so we can appreciate and understand each other's culture. So also you can recognize microaggressions when they occur. I always say there is no right way to, um, for an individual who's been hurt to address a microaggression or a racial trauma. It's on you on how you wish to respond. Some people will call it out in the, in the moment and just say, you know what, that, that wasn't appropriate and this is why. Other people don't say anything and that's okay too if they feel like they're not in a place to call it out. Or some people do what they call calling in. Is so, for example, if Deanna said something, I'm sorry I'm using you, Deanna, but it says something in a meeting and it didn't land quite right. But I'm going to call her in. Next time me and Deanna are together, I'm going to let her know, but I don't necessarily let her know in front of all the colleagues. There are many ways you can deal with them. Um, definitely become aware of your own biases and start confronting these biases. Um, use I statements when you're talking about any personal hurts. Um, address the behavior and not the person. Um, relationship is so important because, again, I'm going to use you, Deanna. If I know Deanna, and we've been working together for four or five years, and then she did a microaggression against me. Because I know Deanna and I want to keep that relationship um, so that way we're both on the same page, then I will address it with her so that way we can repair and move on. Um, it's really hard to make a repair if it's somebody who um, you felt like did it on purpose or somebody who might have, there might be a power dynamic. And so it's, it's important to know and have a relationship when you are having these conversations. Um, another tactic is to carefully educate others about microaggressions. And I want to be very clear, it is not on any marginalized population to teach the majority, to teach uh, white individuals, to teach um, anybody in power what a microaggression is, what, what it's doing to them. But if you want to, you also have the power to educate, but the onus is not on you to do so. Google is our friend. If you have a question and you're not sure how this is going to land, most things can be found on Google. And you can have an educated conversation about the different topics, again, built in couched in relationship and getting to know each other. So calling in versus calling out. Some key phrases that you can use is when someone says something, you can always say, well, what did you mean by that? Can you clarify? You can also say, you may not realize this, but I found that remark hurtful. Another thing you can say is, is that what you were intending to communicate? Or I'm having a reaction to what was said about, and then insert, you know, the microaggression that occurred. Calling in versus calling out is definitely a personal choice. Sometimes when things are said in a public setting and you feel like if I don't say something, everybody's gonna walk away thinking X, Y, and Z. And so you speak up. And so it, for you, it was important to call it out in the moment. Um, and again, not right, not wrong, however you choose to do it. Calling in, um, again, can be a teachable moment. It can, um, uh, al al allow you to talk about what's going on with the person and have a longer conversation. Because if you're in the middle of a meeting, I'll use this example, and someone comes in, they happen to have an accent. And in the middle of the meeting, and you've never met them before, you say, oh, you have an accent. Where are you from? That's not the appropriate place or time to, to do that. And so the person can choose, you know, right now I'm here to present this presentation. You know, if you want to talk offline, we can do that. Or the person might just ignore it and say, you know, I'm, I'm from Canada and, and keep it moving. So again, you can decide how you want to address it as long as you feel comfortable in doing so. It's also helpful to consider the responses you'll likely face. 
And um, I'm not sure how many, I can't tell how many people are on this call, but I know this is a huge organization. So I'm hoping everybody gets a chance to see this live or see the video, but you might receive defensiveness that quick. I didn't, you know, that's not what I meant. You know, why are you so sensitive? And so be prepared for um, somebody to come, come at you not in an appropriate way, or they might come appropriately. You know, will you trigger an argument? And these are things, unfortunately, you have to think about very quickly in the moment. Um, and you can say, it doesn't matter if I'm gonna trigger an argument, I need to call this out. Or you might say, you know what, this is gonna, this might be something that myself and Deanna need to talk about later because this is a longer conversation than the time we have now. Um, will it affect your relationship? It might very well affect your relationship. Um, I just did a, a, a talk on Tuesday. I was I do racial trauma talks with um, probation officers and we do breakout rooms and somebody quickly came back into the breakout room. I said, you know, we're supposed to be in breakouts. And she explained what somebody said and it was a micro assault she felt and she felt uncomfortable and so she left. And so that is also an option and they work together and so I'll be helping them to repair because she thought it was important that he know how know, knew how he hurt her. And so again, these things might affect relationships, but is it worth it to you to not hold on and, and let these assaults continue to occur? Will you regret not saying something? And so again, only you can decide for yourself whether or not you would regret you know, letting these slights slide. Again, Sometimes there's a power dynamic. It might be your boss, it might be your boss's boss. And in those moments, you know, you have to decide how you want to go about it, whether you address it, whether you um, uh, talk to your supervisor about it, talk to a colleague, or even, um, you know, if your supervisors are open, a lot of times they are, you, um, you definitely want to take that open door and that opportunity to explain how you're feeling in that moment. So last but not least, there are ways to overcome unconscious bias. Again, we have to bring that um, a, a blind spot to bring this stuff that's in our, um, not in our awareness to the forefront. And it is possible. The same way I gave you those four words, you had automatic associations, you have to be conscious to check yourself in those automatic associations. So recognize stereotypical thinking. Um, I think Deanna is going to be um, emailing out a video about microaggressions. I had an opportunity to watch it. And there are so many stereotypes in that video, you know, to point out how microaggressions happen. Microaggressions tend to happen because we're running off of a stereotype and we have to be able to check those things. Replace biases and assumptions. Don't assume. You know, we, there's that running joke. You know, if you assume, you make a blank out of you and me. So don't assume. You know, feel free to, again, Google. Nobody's there to teach you. But if you have a relationship, have these difficult conversations. No matter how many presentations you have and how many podcasts you listen to and how many times you talk about race, it may be difficult, but it doesn't mean you don't have these conversations. Understand the, the individual. And so the person that was hurt by something I said, I need to understand their perspective. I need to be in their shoes, how they felt in that meeting when I asked, oh, where are you from? And they're there in a professional way to present something. Um, explore a new perspective. So right now I come from my perspective. I come from, you know, my, my identity, my gender, my sexuality, my socioeconomic status. This is the life in which I, I'm, I'm in. I need to broaden, just like we all do, our um, perspectives. So that way we can understand and start appreciating, not tolerating, but appreciating other um, walks of life and other um, individuals. And then increase opportunity for positive contact. And so within your department, we have staff meetings. It doesn't have to be the same staff meeting every week for an hour where you're going over numbers. Yes, that's important, but relationship is also important. Increase uh, opportunity to have positive contact. 
maybe half an hour out of your weekly staff meetings, you're focused on a different topic, a different conversation, having um, one of your um, colleagues present on something that they've listened to, that they've heard about. Because the more you have these conversations, the more the understanding can occur. And so uh, with that, I'm gonna open it up to questions. What we can do now is um, type any questions, comments, aha moments in the chat. Deanna is going to um, feed them to me, and I think we have some time. Yeah, we have we have a good 10, 15 minutes, Deanna. So anything going on in the chat? Yes, ma'am. So our first question is, what is appropriate if you are a bystander to a racial microaggression? What is the appropriate response? So I'm, I'm really glad they asked this, because a lot of times we are bystanders, and so um, a couple of things you want to you want to read the situation, but there's power in calling something out when you see it. So, say for example, Deanna, I'm gonna use you as an example <laughs> again. Deanna says something to me like, "Oh, you know," um, and we're we're in the meeting. Oh, Jennifer, your hair looks so nice. What kind of what kind of phrase is that? Is that your real hair? You know, and so. The person saying that I might feel uncomfortable, like I'm, I'm so embarrassed. She just asked me that in front of all these people. But if someone else takes that power on and say, you know what, Deanna, that is not the time to ask that kind of question. And, you know, and using the words that was that was considered a microaggression. And you can take the time to explain why or not. Or you can explain later, like, Deanna, that this is not the time for that. And you doing that as a bystander, I can't tell you how many times that's helped me as a black woman when someone else calls out the injustice. Because oftentimes what goes on in my head, and I'm not gonna speak for every black person, but what goes on in my head is, are they gonna say I'm pulling the race card again? Are they gonna say, Jennifer always talks about race? Are they gonna say I'm hypersensitive? If I say it the wrong way, am I considered the angry black woman? And so when my white colleagues call out something, that's powerful because unfortunately white voices are heard louder than black voices and marginalized populations and so calling it like you see it not being a bystander and again reading the situation as well you can always go back and check in with me um later and that is being a good bystander and then you can always talk to the person who did the microaggression and you can help educate and teach and it's not on me who was hurt to do that with that person Any other questions, comments? Anyone want to unmute, unmute yourself? Do you want me to stop sharing screens so um, people can see each other? Sure, or? sure, that'd be great. Okay. Um, and there's another question. Is there a way to distinguish between a microaggression or someone who is just abrasive? Yes. <laughs> so I, to me, it's kind of obvious when someone's going in a slight or just saying something off the cuff, but they know that was inappropriate. Um, and I, that I have no problem calling out in the moment. Um, but that's that's me. And so, um, the, again, micro makes it seem like it's small and that it's that is not impactful, but it really is. And so you have overt racism and covert racism you have overt microaggressions you have covert you have things that are in people's awareness making you know racial jokes or making comments you also have things that you know i, I love that video that you sent out Deanna. so i'm hoping everybody watches it it gives really good examples of you know you, you people can catch themselves and say oh wow i didn't mean that 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 landed the, the wrong way and so Again, the end. I'm gonna use you. We're in a meeting, <laughs> um, and you know, I I like her braids, and but it's not the time or the place for for me to ask that. Even as a, a black person, um, uh, somebody changing their vernacular when they're addressing me, you know, like, oh, you know, good morning, good morning, hey, what's up, Jennifer? You know, like that is a microaggression. That person did not mean to, to do that, but I feel like the other, because everybody else got a good morning, got a smile, and I get a, hey, what's up, with some hands. And so um, that is more micro. Macro is somebody um, saying, you know what, we're going to um, ask Jennifer to give this presentation on microaggressions. And just, just imagine that I this is not the work I do. And you know why? Well, she's black, she knows about microaggressions. That's overt. They they think 
and they are biased towards the fact that a person who is a person of color that knows everything about X, Y, and Z. And that can happen all the time. So you can call it out if you feel comfortable, pull the person aside and call it in, or you can let it slide. But again, by letting it slide, um, you might hurt yourself in the, in the long run because then it won't stop. Oh, wait, are you on mute, Deanna? Or I can't hear me. Hold on. No, it was me. It was me. Okay. I, was, I was still muted. Um, so there's a second part to this. And um, if you don't mind, I'll take the first um, step. It says, is, is there a space to share a hurt from someone in a leadership position without fearing retribution? Mm -hmm. And um, here we're treating this very much like um, our um, safety together journey. Mm -hmm. Um, and thinking about how do we close the power dynamic and creating a safe space for all of us. So ensuring that we all feel safe enough to um, speak to a colleague and we know it's hard. And if we don't feel safe speaking to the person who did it, how do we really arc it up and ensure that there is no retaliation or retribution um, because that there's just no room for that here um, yes. in our organization. And if in fact there is, if, if you feel as if you've been retaliated against, then you need to report that to someone. Um, HR, you need to report it to um, someone in your facility or um, leadership um, at your facility or at corporate and, so that something can can be done. So, but absolutely there's no, there's no mm -hmm. room for retaliation. Yes. Thanks, Deanna. Mm -hmm. um, questions? Someone once said to me that we, if they put it in quotes, are getting too sensitive. Ooh. How would you respond? So again, whether you have a relationship with the person or not, I think makes a makes a difference. So let's start with you don't know this person and, and you've made a comment. They say, Oh, you're being so sensitive. You can go one of two ways. You can really explain how it's not being sensitive, that what they said was inappropriate, and that if it was any other kind of trauma. So for example, I we, we use this a lot and sometimes it's comparable and sometimes it's not. But if someone comes into my office and says they were sexually assaulted. I would never say, well, are you sure? Is that what really happened? Do you think you misread the situation? And when I go in and say, you know what? I feel like I was discriminated against, or I feel like somebody just did a microaggression and I tell what the microaggression is. As a supervisor, as a, a colleague, as an ally, your first response shouldn't be, are you sure? You know, you're being really sensitive. You know, that's not what they meant. You wanna believe what they say um and you want to recognize that it is the impact that it's having and so what you can say when somebody tells you oh you know you're being too sensitive if if you know the person i'd like to break it down as to why it's not about being sensitive but why what was said was wrong if you don't feel like you want to go that way and they're saying this you know in front of 10 other people like oh you're being too sensitive you can say no what you said hurt because x y and z or you, you can't let it go but for me i i find by letting it go people walk away thinking that it's okay and i i'm trusting that you know robert wood johnson is trying to create a, an environment that if you say you were microaggressed against that you say what you what was hurtful was hurtful that the environment starts to recognize that my job is not to be defensive but to be supportive and that you know what i will do different next time i i'm understanding your perspective or i'm getting there but i'm going to get there um we're not all at the same level so i always i always joke and say I do these presentations and I'm trying to get people to drink the Kool-Aid, but some people don't even know there's Kool-Aid in the cup. Some people aren't even at the table. And so my my goal is to get everybody at the table, recognize that there's Kool-Aid. I know it's probably a bad analogy for those of you who know Jim Jones and drinking the Kool-Aid, but, but really understanding that 
not everybody is doing this work. They should be. And we don't want to leave anybody behind, at least not in my organization. We're trying really hard to educate, but you have to educate yourself. You can't just do one one hour equitable encounter and think, okay, I got this. I got microaggressions. No, do some more reading, get some articles. There's a lot out there about it. And the next month, whatever the topic is, keep learning and keep growing. I think I moved a little away from the question. <laughs> Definitely. So um, before we get to the next question, there's a few questions in the chat about, um, can you get the PowerPoint? And she's already provided it and it will, it's on, it will be on the bridge um under ending racism together where other resources are it also um, there's also questions about uh different resources about racism and equity so you can go to the ending racism microsite um on rwjbh.org and there's a, a whole slew of resources on equity and racism and um things that you can um view Okay. Um, and there's there was an interesting question about how do um, and I might not have the exact wording, but it talked about how do microaggressions manifest themselves in a virtual in in remote environment. Hmm. Have you seen um, some that's, ways? That's a really good question. Um, I've seen a few ways. Yeah, please, uh, one please, time yes. I thought one time I thought that my microphone wasn't even on. Because every time I tried to interject, they just they just ignored me. I was like, "Oh, am I really unmuted?" Yes, um, so I, I think, example. yeah. So that yeah. was my one. Okay. Yeah, I I spent the first part of the pandemic working um, in a jail, so we weren't not we were not virtual, and I spent the last six months working virtually. And I think when we talk about power and privilege, you know, I'm an associate director, so very rarely do I get spoken over. <laughs> Um, but I think coming, recognizing that and making sure that I, you know, in my power and privilege and not doing that to somebody else. And so I, I can see how microaggressions can happen on Zoom. It just the same way it can happen in person. Even making comments about, I mean, it, someone's background in the middle of uh, um, uh, a presentation or in the middle of uh, a conversation that you can have that conversation on the side, but we're in a professional environment, you know, being really conscious of what you're saying and how you're saying it. Were there any other? I think I saw one about cancel culture. Did you see that one? Yes. I so I think the person asks, well, how do I feel about cancel culture? And so I, I like to think about patterns of behavior and allowing oops to happen. So if I were to make a mistake and were to do something, even if it was egregious, I know my pattern of behavior is that's maybe not who I am. I've made a mistake. You know, let me learn from it. Let me grow from it. You know, and I hope you don't write me off, but it's your privilege to do so if I hurt you. Um, however, when we talk about cancel culture, if there's a pattern of behavior, you know, going over a couple of years, like I know a lot of times people go back to old tweets, they go back to old things. Um, and they say, no, I've learned and I've grown, you know, it's up to you whether or not you want to, like, I'm not going to judge if you say, you know what, I'm not dealing with that person anymore, buying their stuff because of whatever they've have said. That is totally a personal um, uh, choice. But for me, I, I like to even though I don't know these famous people, but look at the pattern of behavior. <laughs> you know, if it's if it's a one-off thing and I, you know, and I feel like they are doing the work, you know, then I, I just take it at face value and that they've apologized. But if it's a, you know, it's a pattern, then I might stop buying music or stop patronize, uh, uh, patronizing different locations, so. Yeah. So um, I, I think that we need to wrap it up, but thank you so much, Dr. Jones. Um, we we really appreciate you and the time you've spent with us. Um, I encourage all of you to um, take the evaluation that we will send out. And then I also want to remind you to join us the last Thursday of the month. Next month, we will have Dr. Jonathan Holloway talking about the history of Juneteenth as well as June 3rd, where we will have um, Isabel Wilkerson, who will talk about her book, Cast. 
Um, so thank you again. Thank you everyone for uh, signing in today. Take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm.